now we move on to non-elementary reactions. And as you can guess, a non-elementary reaction is one that doesn't occur in a single step, but rather in a series of steps and oftentimes involves the formation of intermediates that don't show up in the balanced equation. For example, this first step has N2O2 formed as one of its intermediates, but that's nowhere to be found in the balanced reaction equation. For a non-elementary reaction, there will always be one step that is the slowest step. And because it's the slowest step, it's called the rate determining step. It's the one that determines the rate. And because of this, you can express the rate of a non-elementary reaction simply by representing the rate of the rate determining step. And so if the first one is, a, is the rate determining step in this case, then you would simply express the rate as though it were an elementary reaction of step one. And so if the first step was the rate determining step, your rate would equal K1, your rate constant of your first step, times NO to the second power because you have NO as the reactant and it's raised to the power of two because it has a stoichiometry of two. The reason you can do that is because any one individual step, you can sort of treat that as though it were an elementary reaction. And with elementary reactions, you can always put the stoichiometry as the exponent here, as the coefficient. And so if the first step were the rate determining step of this reaction, you would express the rate of the entire reaction as the rate of the first step. And so it would be the rate of the reaction equals K1 times NO to the second power. This is okay. And the reason you can do that is because NO is something that shows up in your balanced equation. Your balanced overall equation involves NO. So this is a very, very legal way of expressing the rate. And notice that this is a case where you see a bit of a deviation from the idea that you can express a rate as this raised to its stoichiometry times that raised to its stoichiometry. Notice that H2 is zero order in this one. You could write down H2 raised to the zero power, but that's why we can't always use stoichiometry as our exponent in rate equations because in this case, H2 is not second order with regard to this reaction. H2 is zero order because H2 is not relevant in the one step that determines the rate. So if that first step is the rate determining step, it becomes fairly simple to solve it. You just express the first step as an elementary reaction. So you just take this, the concentration of that and raise it to this power. And you can express the rate that way. A problem emerges when the second or third step is the rate determining step. And what we'll go through first is an interesting thing, and that is that if the last step is the rate determining step, you have to express the rate as though this were an elementary reaction. So you basically say that the rate here is equal to K some rate constant of step three times N2O, which is one of the reactants of this step, raised to the first power, times H2 raised to the first power. Now this is a bit of a problem. You can't express the rate of this as the rate of that. If you were trying to do this in a lab and trying to figure out how much NO you could add or how much H2 you could add and what would change with the rate, you can't do that because this is based on N2O. And N2O is not part of this equation and so that's not a legal way of expressing the rate. And so what you have to do is you have to do a proof using what they call an equilibrium approximation, and we'll go through that in a second. The nice thing that happens is if the final step of a non-elementary reaction, if the final step is the rate determining step, it just so happens that you can do a proof and show that the stoichiometry actually does hold. And so for this one, you could end up writing the rate as the rate equals sum k, which is a, an observed rate constant, times NO to the second power, times H2 to the second power. Notice that that is what you would do if this were an elementary reaction, because you just take this, raise it to its stoichiometry, and take this one, raise it to its stoichiometry. 
So it's not immediately a very, very good way of expressing the rate because N2O is not part of this equation. And so it's not an acceptable way of expressing the rate of this entire reaction. But the nice thing is that if the last step is the rate determining step, it will always end up that your stoichiometry ends up holding. And those are the exponents that you raise these two initial reactants to. However, if the second step is the rate determining step, and it turns out that it is in this reaction, so we'll just do a star there, the second step in this reaction is the rate determining one. It's the slow step that determines the rate of the entire reaction. What you end up with is that you express the rate as though this were the overall elementary reaction. And so the rate would be expressed as the rate equals k of step two, which is the rate constant for step two, times N2O2 raised to the first power, because the stoichiometry is one, times H2 raised to the first power. So you could express it this way if the second step was the rate determining step. You could express it as though step two were an elementary reaction. The only issue is that this involves N2O2, which is not anything that shows up in this formula. And it's definitely not one of the reactants of this formula. And so what we will have to do is we'll have to use an approximation and a proof in order to express this rate, which is the rate of the reaction, in order to express it in terms of NO and H2, which are the original two reactants. And so now we will go through the proof that allows us to convert this rate determining step and this rate law into an acceptable rate law that uses the actual reactants that you use in the overall equation. So now we'll go through that and we'll explain the reasoning behind how this works. So in this case, step two is the rate determining step. And if we want to express the rate of this entire reaction as though step two were an elementary reaction, we would end up with this rate law that the rate equals k of step two, the rate law of step two, or rate constant of step two, times N2O2 raised to the first power, times H2 raised to the first power. This is one way that you could express this rate, but the only problem is that if you're in a lab, you're never going to be putting in any N2O2. And so you won't know what happens when you add NO unless you're able to express this rate law in terms of the actual components that are being put into the solution. And so what you do with this is you use this as the rate law, but we do what's called an equilibrium approximation. And what that is, is it's based on an assumption that because step one is one of the fast steps, you can assume that step one reaches equilibrium very quickly. And remember that in equilibrium, what that means is that the rate of the forward reaction is the same as the rate of the reverse reaction. And so what you can do with this equilibrium approximation is you can set the forward reaction of step one as being having a rate that is equal to the reverse reaction of step one. And that's fair to do because remember at equilibrium, step one moving forward is going to be the same as step one moving backwards. And we can assume that this equilibrates so rapidly because the rate determining step is the slow one. So we just assume that step one reaches equilibrium very quickly. Here's how we express that. We express this as an elementary reaction. The forward rate for step one is going to be k1, just some rate constant k for the forward reaction, times NO raised to the second power. Remember, any individual step is an elementary reaction, so you can use this stoichiometry as the exponent there. And then for the reverse reaction, which is exactly the same as that rate, you express that as the rate constant of the backwards reaction, so k minus one times the reactant of the reverse reaction, which is N2O2, and we raise that to the first power. So what we've done is we've figured out how to express the forward rate of step one, 
which is just K1 times concentration of NO raised to the second power. And we've set that equal to the reverse reaction of step one, which is K negative one times N2O2 to the first power. Now this is very nice because what we can do is we can solve for N2O2 now and we can express it in different terms. And so what we do is we divide both sides of this by K minus one. So we'll divide this by K minus one to get rid of that. And we'll divide this side by K minus one. And then what we end up with here is the expression that K1 divided by K minus one times NO squared equals N2O2. And this is very convenient because now we found a way of expressing N2O2 in terms of the initial reactants that actually show up in the balanced equation. And so what we do is we take this value for N2O2 and we substitute it into this equation there. And so what that means is that we're basically going to be rewriting this, but instead of the concentration of N2O2, instead we're going to be expressing that as K1 over K minus one times the concentration of NO squared. And so here's what we've done. We've taken this K2 and that comes down here. Instead of N2O2, we've now replaced that with K1 over K minus one times NO squared. And then we just bring down this H2 to the first power. That now gives us a rate law that is expressed only in terms of the actual initial reactants of the balanced reaction. And because these numbers, K2, K1, K negative one, because those are all just numbers, you can multiply them and divide them with each other and all you end up with is just a new number. And so what we're going to do is we're gonna take these three right here and we're gonna simplify that into a quantity called K observed. And that's the observed rate law constant. It's the observed rate constant of the overall reaction and then we end up with a way of expressing the rate law, which initially started as the rate law for the rate determining step. We now can express that rate law in the terms of the initial reactants in the balanced overall equation. And so what we've ended up with now is that the rate of the entire reaction equals K observed times NO squared times H2 to the first power. And that is an acceptable way of writing the rate law for this reaction. And notice that it's not a perfectly stoichiometric thing. Yes, the NO is raised to the second power, but the H2 is not raised to its stoichiometry. That's why you can't always assume that stoichiometry is the exponent in rates. You can with equilibria with a capital K, you can always use the stoichiometry as the exponent. With rates, if it's non-elementary, you can't. And this is the proof for how to do this. If the second step is rate limiting, rate determining, then what you have to do is express it as though it were an elementary reaction, and then do some algebra. Solve to find out a way that you can express N2O2 in terms of these initial components. And the way that you do that, which is what we've just done, is we used the equilibrium approximation. We assume that this step reaches equilibrium so quickly that we can set the forward rate of this step and the reverse rate of this step as being exactly the same. And when we do that, that allows us to now solve for N2O2 and express it in terms of the initial reactant that is actually a part of that equation. And this proves a number of things. It's that you can always solve starting with the rate determining step as long as you can assume that the prior steps equilibrate and then you can do some substitution there. It also shows us that rate laws aren't always going to be stoichiometric. You can't always use that stoichiometric coefficient as the exponent that you raise each quantity to. And so let's review this. If you were to have the third step be rate determining, then it would turn out that you could do this kind of equilibrium approximation twice, and it turns out 
that the stoichiometry would actually hold up. So you could just express the rate as NO to the second times H2 to the second times some constant. If the first step was the rate determining one, it's not always going to be perfect stoichiometry. You could express the entire rate as NO squared times K of step one. But notice that yes, well, NO is raised to the second in this. It's actually zero order with regard to H2 because H2 is not a factor whatsoever in the rate determining step. So if the first one is rate determining, it's easy enough to express it because you're always starting with the initial reactants and you can simply just raise those to some stoichiometry. But the rate of the entire reaction will only be a, f a function of NO squared and it will not be a function of H2 squared. And so it's zero order with regard to H2, but it's second order with regard to NO. The most complex way is if one of the middle steps is rate determining. That's when you start using the equilibrium approximation and you basically use that in order to find a value for this reactant that can be expressed in terms of these two quantities. And so that's what we've done here. Ultimately, a lot of times you won't be going through and doing this complicated proof because it does take some time. But you should use this as a way of recognizing that you cannot always assume that the stoichiometric coefficient is always the exponent with rate laws. That's not the way that it goes. Rate laws can follow stoichiometry if it's elementary or if it just happens to pan out that way. But it's not always going to be the case and that is because certain things play a bigger role in the rate determining step than others. But if you realize that the rate determining step, you can always use that to express the rate of the entire reaction, then there's always going to be some way that you can find a proof to express it in terms of the initial reactants that you want to express your rate law in. That's a complex lesson and it's not something that you'll be tested on extensively on timed exams because it does take a while. But it is something to recognize and it helps you realize that you can't always use the stoichiometric coefficients if it's a complicated rate that involves a multi-step reaction with a rate determining step. Now, the final one that we'll be going through in this double agent model is tables. And tables are nice because it's all experimental values and you can draw simpler conclusions without having to do this math. But if you understand this math, there will not be a rate type question that will really baffle you on your exam.